Hello, good morning and welcome to Ensemble Conversations with me, Mark Kilmurray. My guest this morning has written The Removalists, Don's Party, The Club, Emerald City, just a few of the famous titles from the great David Williamson. David has been writing plays for 50 years. Crunch Time played at the Ensemble Theatre earlier this year, David's last play before retiring, so he says. We're delighted to have David with us this morning. Good morning, David. Good morning, Mark. <laughs> Good to be here. Well, good to be not there, but I'm in Queensland. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, how is isolation treating you? How have, have you uh, dealt with the last few months? Well, look, we're lucky compared with, say, Victoria or even New South Wales in that um, there are very few cases up here. So life is has returned to more or less normal. You can go out and eat at a restaurant or you can meet your family. You can have up to 30 people in your home at the moment. But with this yes. thing, you never know. It, uh, it could all change tomorrow, as you well know. Yes, the message changes each week and, uh, and from month to month. David, since you announced your retirement, most, the most thing people say to me when I meet them and we're talk, discussing David Williamson, the writer, they're saying, is he really? <laughs> but you were definite. Yes, I look. I, I've done my fifty years. Um, it's, been a, it's been a terrific ride. I've been extremely fortunate to get uh, the best productions, directors such as yourself, and actors uh, do my plays for fifty years. Uh, I've had the thrill of seeing audiences reacting to the plays and coming to the plays, and they were still coming fifty years later. So I thought best. best <laughs> Best to get out while they're still coming. Uh, don't want to be staggering around at 99, uh, muttering about why the audiences aren't there anymore. Um, so g go out when 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 things are still good. And I'm I'm not idle. I'm I'm writing my memoirs and having fun doing doing that. My wife tells me I am writing my memoir, not memoirs. Uh, um, right. Uh, it's singular. So um, that's I'm trying to. Uh, uh, r recall uh, a lifetime of, um, of of life in the theatre mm, and family. Though. Fascinating. That would be. Uh, uh, can't wait to read it. It could be memoirs if you have volume one and volume two. I, I, I guess. Well, I, I, hope I'll, I hope I'll just get it all in one volume. Yeah, right, uh, David. You have a tendency to tap into the zeitgeist, and uh, when you're writing your plays, your last play, Crunch Time, the last play. Uh, any of us would be doing for a while, who knew? Um, perhaps you could just explain the themes of Crunch Time because it was a very powerful piece and um, a wonderful piece to direct and we had a great cast, but your play tapped into exactly what people were talking about. What was the, the theme of Crunch Time? Well, look, there were two themes, actually, um, that I tried to meld together. And the first one, of course, was end-of-life issues. Um, it, um, it strikes me that uh, people should be able to decide when enough is enough. And uh, for, for the law or for the church or anyone to say um, that that um, is an act uh, against God or whatever um, saddened me um, because I think that most people don't want to go on living if there's no quality of life uh, and there's nothing left for them. Um, I, I, I'd say it would be a pretty cruel God who wanted people to suffer on through excruciating pain for months and months. Um, I'm sure if there is a benevolent God, he wouldn't want that to happen. So I'm not quite sure why the church is so insistent on preventing it. So that was one theme. Yes. The other was sibling rivalry. Uh, I've got five children. I know, <laughs> I know that... Children are always uh, aware of favoritism within the family, as, as one child favoured more than the other. And most people, although all parents say, but we have no favourites, we love you equally, the children suspect underneath that there is a favourite and they usually know who it is and uh, there's a lot of emotion and a lot of angst. So this situation was based on a real-life situation of a friend of mine who, who tragically, um, and he allowed me to write it, um, decided he'd built up a wonderful business and he wanted his two very capable sons to run it. Uh, he wanted to step down and uh, to run it. But it didn't work out. The temperaments of the two sons were diametrically opposed. They fought. He had to get rid of one of them. And instead of sitting them both down, yeah. he thought he could keep emotion out of it. And... Uh, and and fire one of them 
uh, by a letter from the board, <laughs> and that was absolutely explosive. Yeah. The, the one that was fired had always had secret doubts that he wasn't the favoured one, so when that happens, it's boom, the whole family dynamic is is wrecked. Uh, it's, uh, and part of the journey of the play was the journey towards reconciliation as it was the journey towards assisted dying. Yes, and very moving at the end, a few scenes, of course, and very moving when we actually decided to uh, cancel the shows because of uh, Corona. And that last scene was even more moving because we're thinking, when would we be back? And the actors came in and did a recording, a, a version of it that night without an audience, which was very strange. But it was a, a beautiful play. Very, very, very well done. Very well done uh, to do the recording on um, of such quality in such short time. But also, thank you, Mark. Beautifully directed, beautifully cast. Uh, I couldn't have got um, I couldn't have got a better production. And the space at the ensemble is perfect for a piece like this because the audience cannot get away from the drama. They're right in with it. I've always felt. That the uh, that the ensemble is a perfect place for realism or naturalistic drama that in which you want the audience to be close up and personal. Um, I think the audiences don't like any more those thousand seat theatres where the actors are little specks in the distance. They're used to seeing on their 82 inch television screens actors <laughs> up close and personal, uh, and it's just too distancing, but the ensemble offers um, the chance for you to be in there amongst it. Yes, it's great uh, space, you're, you're right, and uh, there's no getting away with it. As I say to actors, you, you have to go for it. Uh, there's, there's, there's no hiding with those big gestures which you might get in a, a larger space. At the beginning, you're... And it's, Sorry, it's a tricky go. space, too, because I've directed, uh, I've directed three plays three plays of mine there myself, and... Yes. Um, and I think you gave me the golden rule, 45 degrees. Uh, people, it, because there are people on three sides, you've got to somehow choreograph most of the interactions to happen at 45 degrees so there are no head, backs of heads all the time to the audience. It's, yeah. as, it's, it's not as easy a space to direct in as you would think. No, it's, uh, it was in the round and then it became the three quarters. So it's sort of almost round, but apart from an audience behind you. Yes, it's tricky, but as you say, that intimacy is wonderful. And the, to feel that energy from the audience and the actor is, uh, is priceless. Oh, it's, it's, it's a magic night. When a play is connecting at the ensemble, it's one of the magic nights in, uh, in my life. Yeah, great. Because you can look around at those three sides and see the faces concentrating on the, um, uh, on the action and yeah. absorbed in the action. And I've often had audience members say, Hey, you're laughing at your own jokes. Uh, they, they're watching me. They're watching me at the same time as they're watching the the play. And I say, no, look, I'm truly not that narcissistic. Uh, I'm not Donald Trump. I um, I actually watch uh, with delight what the actors do with my lines. And half the time, I'm laughing at their inventiveness because lines are only lines until a very good actor brings them to life. Yes, indeed. At the beginning of your career, David, were you conscious of writing plays that gave Australia a voice? Because the, the, the environment when you first started writing was very different. Yeah, look, uh, younger writers can't understand how bleak it was when I was starting as a stage writer. There were very few Australian stories being told in any medium. There was no film industry. There were a few uh, embryo police shows or one or two on television. Uh, and all of our stage work virtually, apart from the odd play like One Day of the Year or before that, the summer of the 17th doll, mm. few and far between. Once every 10 years there'd be an Australian play. The rest was mainly English, a little bit of American and very little European. So Australian actors in those days uh, would go abroad to England to learn the 43 regional British accents so they could um, they could come back and do English work on Australian stages and that made us very angry because we knew we were human beings like anyone else we had the same emotions as anyone else in the world we had the same problems and um, and we had drama uh, 
so it was like a dam bursting. When Betty Burstall came back and said, enough is enough, I'm starting La Mama. I want Australian writing. I want Australian stories. And at the same time in Sydney, uh, John Bell came back from England and says, I, wa I want Australian work. Um, and John Clark at Jane Street says, I want Australian work. And suddenly the dam burst and the... The, the artistic directors of the mainstream theatres were amazed because they, I was told by John Sumner at the M MTC, we don't do Australian plays because Australia, virtually, he didn't put it in those, <laughs> these words, right. Australia is too boring and no drama ever happens here. <laughs> uh, uh, um, and he, he, his job, he felt, was to educate and uplift the barbarous natives with the yeah. finer points of uh, mainly English culture because he was English. Right. And... Um, uh, so, when that made a, a lot of us very angry, and there was energy because we said, "No, this is not good enough. We're having our stories." And and the the John Sumners of the world were amazed when they came and saw the reaction of the audience because this was the first time in a long while Australian audiences had been able to see themselves on stage, mm. their own predicaments, their own stories, their own accents, and, and it validated them as human beings and as a nation. We are not boring. We are a very interesting place. Yes. We have drama like everyone else and you're going to see it. Yes. It, well, it felt like Australia grew up with you in terms of the plays and the film uh, from that time over those decades. It sort of discovered itself. Well, there is, um, yeah, uh, there is a, a poetry to the Australian language, the way English is used in Australia. Uh, um, yes. and, and there are rhythms that are particular uh, to Australian usage and there is a lot of black humour in Australian usage and I used to delight in, in our speech rhythms, in our humour um, and in our characterisations uh, so it was a joy to me to see my audience reacting to their own lives and you studied psychology at Melbourne University and you said you have called yourself sort of like a social scientist then and then began writing those early plays. There must have been a very strong link between your study and what you were watching and what you were then recording on, on the page. Yes, it, it, it was, Mark. Um, I, I graduated as a mechanical engineer first mm. up from Monash University, but even though I graduated, I was never very interested. I went back to Melbourne <laughs> Uni, Uni and did a, an MA prelim, which was virtually an arts honours course in psychology. And by the time I'd got to the fourth year in psychology, I was, uh, I was obsessed with studying social psychology, which is the way people influence each other, uh, which is the uh, group pressures, which is the way language is used as yeah. a tool of social advancement as a tool of retribution, of, uh, uh, of revenge. Uh, language is not just for communication, it's, um, it's to achieve your psychological ends. And I was going on, I'd been accepted to do postgraduate um, in psychology, but I found myself doing the same sort of thing on stage as I wanted to do as a research social psychologist. I was never interested in, and this got me into trouble with with, with critics, I was never interested in breaking theatrical boundaries. I didn't want to invent new forms of theatre. I thought naturalism or realism was a perfectly wonderful form of theatre, perfectly suited to investigating the social pressures uh, and the social behaviour uh, that I was interested in. And audiences felt the same. Um, they didn't necessarily want to see someone dangling from the ceiling on fish hooks. Um, um, uh, with with a badly out of tune guitarist in the corner and and, yeah. and stuff sprinkling down yeah. from the oh, yes. you know I, I there are those theatre for the theatre's sake I've never been one of those I think theatre for the exploration of human social behaviour is what I'm about. Yes, absolutely. At Don's Party, one of your earlier plays that was a huge hit, at the Prem Factory and. La Mama wanted uh, a harder hitting play, which I, I guess, then became the, the was the removalist. So there was two sides of, of the dramatist there, with with one for the that idea of the middle class and election night, and then the very brutal and uh, working class feel of the removalists. Um, that yes, was, that, that must have been a juggle at the beginning. 
Yes, I took I took Don's party and I said, oh, it's too middle class. Haven't you got anything a bit more punchy? Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I remembered the story, a removalist I'd been working with, uh, uh, he told me the story on the way when I was shifting the furniture with him. Um, and I thought that's... that's Drama is that sort of drama is a warning shot um, to the audiences. You say you think we're nice, you think we're polite, you think we care about each other. Well, sometimes we do, but sometimes we don't. Sometimes we can behave very badly indeed. And um, the the removalist was a um, uh, a warning about how nasty things can get when human egos uh, clash and are pushed to the limit. It was the first time I was introduced to your work at drama school. Second year students did the removalists and I, I, I dread to think what the Australian accents were like. We thought they were fantastic at the time, but this is in the UK in Coventry. And it was so what? powerful and so uh, amazing. Like for us as drama students to see that work, uh, you know, being handcuffed and fights and it was very brutal. So it was, it was, it was brilliant as well. And at that time it was the early 80s and there's a lot of uh, Stephen Burkoff type plays around and it, it fitted perfectly into that zeitgeist. So it yeah. was wonderful. But your well, plays... It, 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 sorry. It was miscategorized at the start um, as a, a searing indictment of police brutality. Well, it was, it was nothing of the sort. It was a very dark comedy yes. about very bad male behaviour because Kenny Carter, the supposed victim, was just as bad as the two cops. In fact, he was worse than the young yes. cop uh, yes. who, who eventually killed him. Yeah. yeah uh, so it, 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 it took a while for the real genre of that to be recognised. Yeah, I'm roaring with laughter as you were watching it, yes, and the brutality is shocking, but you laugh with it. And the removalists in Dunn's Party and many of your plays have been hits overseas. It's interesting how that Australian voice of yours that you created has carried worldwide. Yeah, well, I think it was uh, Flaubert, and I'm not, con uh, I'm not comparing myself with the great Flaubert, but he, he did say, um, all great art is provincial. Um, you've got to get the surface details of your culture right. You've got to get your culture exact. Uh, and the universals will automatically follow because the universals underlie all human behavior. So you've got to get it authentic at the surface and then um, human emotions and the, the uh, universal, the way any human being reacts to situations is based on emotions that are universal so of course we still recognize greek drama yeah. we still um uh, we, we still understand why medea um uh, is absolutely furious to the point of self-destruction about her husband's infidelity we still have that emotion now uh, so yes if you get yeah the surface right the universals will lie underneath David, you then uh, you transferred uh, quite early on into film writing. How was that for you, and what was the difference between writing for the theatre? I mean, there are obvious differences, I, uh, obviously, but for, for what, where the ideas of yours were coming from for film rather than theatre, or was that more of a collaboration with the director or whoever has approached you to write a film script? It, it, it is very different, uh, Mark. Um, uh, theatre is my first love because theatre... Uh, is, in a way, an examination of language and the way language is used for um, for our psychological ends. Um, film is much more visual, um, atmospheric. Uh, you often feel like you're wrapped over the knuckles if you write a, a, a line of dialogue more than five words in the film. <laughs> it's, um, it's much more narrative-based. Um, Although you've got to still have a good narrative in in, in, in theatre, but what you can do in theatre, which is why I love it, is take pleasure and joy in the way people use and misuse language for their psychological ends. Um, and that's what theatre does best of all. Um, so when I'm writing film, I'm aware I'm speaking a different language more of the story has to be told by image, by facial close-ups, by atmosphere. Um, uh, and um, it's, 
to me, not as exciting an experience as being able to have um, uh, human beings actually um, use and distort and take pleasure in language. The club and uh, Don's party transferred very well to film. Were you happy with the results, the end results of those? Uh, yes, I, I was um, very fortunate to have a very good director um, in Bruce Beresford doing uh, Don's party and the club. I thought also Travelling North transposed very well with Carl Schultz directing yes. a very sensitive rendition. Um, but it's interesting that people who've seen, say, those films think that all the dialogue of the stage version is still there, but over half of it is usually gone. Mm. Um, so that's, to me, that's a great illustration of the difference between film and, and stage. Um, they think it's the same, but unless the dialogue is cut drastically, it doesn't work on film. The monologue, monologues are the first to go and the, the inner monologues. Go. Yes, yes. <laughs> Whereas if you've got a live actor there in a theatre like the Ensemble, yeah. going full bore, um, yeah. on, uh, it's transfixing it uh, is, on, yeah. on a monologue. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but that, there's a three-dimensional human being doing it, so it's much more effective than a flat two-dimensional human being um, uh, on a screen. And they're based on your plays, but writing a, a play, a, a film like Gallipoli and uh, The Year Living Dangerously, I guess the collaboration was more um, between you and the director. Yeah, well, I was lucky to have um, Peter Weir as the director there, a wonderful director of actors and atmospheres. And it was a very good collaboration because I was good at uh, dialogue and, and dramatic structure, and he was great at, at, at at wonderful atmospheres and um, and um, uh, directing actors beautifully, casting beautifully. Um, he was a, a, a film stylist and still is. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought those two collaborations were just uh, one, two of the high points of my career. Yeah, so and they were collaborations. I mean, I'd go, I'd go and sit and talk with him, um, and for hours, the development of the Glipley script was over two years. Um, Year of Living Dangerously, I used to go up and stay at his place overnight and we'd wake up in the morning and get onto it again. So, yes, it is more of a collaboration because um, the visual and the atmospheric um, is a big issue in film. I thought it was very interesting that the last uh, um, few seconds of Gallipoli became a, an hour and a half film of 1917. I thought there should be a, should be a credit there based on an idea by David Williamson. I thought it was very Fascinating. Yes. Uh, uh, will Will Mel Gibson get back in time to stop the charge to death? Yes, right. Well, Wonderful. yeah. Well, well, I did in 10 minutes. He took a whole... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hour and hour. Hour. And one, one tracking shot. Do you think, David, it's easier now as an emerging writer than it was when you first started? I think there are... Uh, Yes and no. I think there are more opportunities now. I'm, I'm so pleased to see the ensemble is doing so much new Australian work. Yeah. Um, so there are more opportunities, but because the, the subsidies have decreased, uh, we've got a, a federal government that basically doesn't like the arts, <laughs> doesn't like the ABC, doesn't like universities. We've got a, a government that, um, that actively punishes them. So, um, the amount of funding for theatre has gone down and the larger theatres increasingly have gone back to the 60s playing it safe with New York hits or London hits or, or, yeah. or Charlie's Aunt or, uh, or <laughs> yet another production of um, what's the interminable one they trot out. It's either um, the importance of being earnest or, uh, or uh, noises off. When, yes. when they can't think of anything else, it's 39 steps, noises off, or, uh, <laughs> or, or no, not Charlie's art. I don't think they do that anymore. But, they, they may. But, yeah. Note to myself not to do Charlie's but, art. Uh, the importance of being earnest. Yeah. Um, yeah, good plays, but we've seen them far too often. Mm. Mm. And Australian theatre has changed as well, hugely, uh, from the beginning of your career. But... Um, for your successful career, do you think that uh, did it get easier, or was there st did you uh, every time you have a new play? I guess because you've had a hugely l long successful career, you feel that it would be easier every time you write a play or come to an opening. I know that's not the case. 
No, no, it's not the case. Uh, it, it, it was a terrific task that I had to have to face every year. I want to write a play that connects with my audience. Uh, I want to be saying something, um, and I am going to try and do it. Well, sometimes it worked better than others. Uh, I've, there are plays that uh, weren't as good as I'd hoped, but most of them worked very well indeed. And as I say, I was lucky to get the best directors, the best spaces, the best actors in the land, um, and it's been by and large a golden ride. Yes, great. How do you stop if you're now, as you say, you're retiring and you say you're writing your memoir, but if you see a particular injustice around you, how do you stop writing about it? Um, I just know that there are a whole generation of younger writers that are equally um, uh, motivated and incensed and they're talented and um, I'm sure they'll be able to tackle it. Um, uh, there, there, there's certainly some good, great new writing in the country and um, uh, I was always one of the charges against me is, oh, you're keeping young writers off our stages. Well, I was doing no such thing. If the theatre companies had stopped doing the importance of being earnest, 39 steps or, uh, or noises off and put an Australian play on with one of our talented younger writers as well as one of my plays, it would have been, uh, would have been fine. Yes. Um, uh, so I'm not getting off to make way because I think there are plenty of spaces for, for younger writers. It's only artistic directors like yourself that need to step up to the mark and do their work. Mm -hmm. yep. And they'll do it. They'll, do, they'll, they'll tackle the big issues. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm too tired to tackle them anymore. Um, I think the last two plays I did were two of the strongest, and mm -hmm. that was Family Values uh, yeah. and um, the time, wonderful yeah. production yeah. you did of Crunch Time. Mm -hmm. um, so... There are big issues, but yeah. uh, they'll, they'll be, there are wonderful writers who will do the big issues from here on in. And we're uh, very happy to have such a back catalogue too, especially for us. We, As I've said to you before, if we announce we've got a David Williamson play coming up, it's sold out before <laughs> before the, uh, the subscribers can get in there. Um, so that's one, wonderful to have that uh, back catalogue. Uh, David, thank you for your wonderful relationship with the Ensemble Theatre. It's been wonderful having you around the building and it's been fantastic always to do your work. I know you and Sandra Bates had a great relationship for all those years as well. And I'm And really then you and I you and I yeah. have had a very productive yeah. relationship too, yeah, which is great. Uh, yeah. I'm very happy to no, I, I'm I have to put in a plug for the ensemble. It's an amazing theatre for for sixty how many years now? Yeah. Sixty three. Yes, yeah. Sixty one, sixty two, yeah, nearly. 62 uh, for 62 years it survived with very little subsidy yeah um, purely because it does very good work that people want to come and see um, uh, and that's that's hugely um, a huge credit to all involved in the ensemble its history and its present situation yeah Thank you. And thank you again for your relationship with us. And thank you for talking to us this morning. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. And we'll talk to you soon and uh, hopefully see you in a foyer soon, sometime in the future. I, I, ha I hope we're allowed to travel sooner or later. Yes, yeah, that's right. It's, it's funny to be imprisoned in your state, but yeah. um, we yes. have been sitting for six months now. We can't get out of them. Well, yes. if we get out, we have to go into a hotel room. Um, That's um, not very appealing. Isolation for two weeks coming back. Uh, so, yes, I hope I'm down there again soon to see the wonderful ensemble in full yeah. swing. Thank um, you. Yeah. Sometime soon. Thank you, David, for talking to us this morning. Keep safe, and I'll see you very soon. Thank you. Great pleasure, Mark. That was David Williamson, wonderful David Williamson. Always a pleasure to talk to him. Next week we have Lee Lewis. I'm talking to the, the artistic director, Lee Lewis, from uh, QTC. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm very excited. Thank you for watching this morning. Thank you for your emails and thank you for everything that, all your support of the Ensemble Theatre and for everything that you're, you're telling us about uh, where you are and keeping safe, etc. So, see you next week. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>